So, Character Art Podcast, Episode 7, with me, John Troy Nickel, Lena, and our uh, ever, uh, ever handsome, dashing, courageous, <laughs> visionary... Wow. Um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> trailblazer, trendsetter. Wow. Keep going, Art, keep going. Uh, maybe the original hipster. Oh, what? Oh. <laughs> it's a big one. All right. Brian Parnell. How's it going, guys? Oh, my God. Hi. How's it going? <laughs> right. Great, great, hey, great. Man. I don't yeah. think I've, uh, I don't think I've spoken to Brian since um, uh, the last time I saw you was, I, I think it was like a GDC probably like five years ago. Oh, God. Um, and it was, um, I think I was heading somewhere with, actually, it was with you, Gavin, wasn't it? I think so. Yeah, we were we were like this, heading this out to some to, to to like the Blizzard after party, and we were on our way out of the GDC, and we bumped into Brian and a couple of other people that were. Oh yeah, probably. Like, was... <laughs> we were uh, we were on our way to the awkward Blizzard party where we just stood around together. <laughs> <laughs> is that how it always is? <laughs> kind of, kind of, yeah. yeah. You wait well, for the... Kenny. You wait for Kenny to show up, or at least yeah. Time. Well, yeah. It's, basically, it was like, "Where's Kenny? <laughs> Kenny said he would be here." Um, but. Uh, I think... We just stood there with like fucking like... blue stickers on our shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was like that room was full of probably like 150 people that were all thinking, "Fuck, where's Kenny?" <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Uh, well, Brian, do you want to uh, do you want to give us your history? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, God, I can go. I'll go all the way back. Uh. I've been listening to you guys' show, and I, I, dude, it's awesome. I'm serious. Like, just awesome. to start off, like, uh, I've been listening since the what was the first one? It was before Josh, and uh, was it Murray? I, yeah, I just pop them on and just just do work while I listen, and I love it. So I'm super <laughs> excited to be here. Oh wow! Oh wow! All right. You guys contacted me. I was I was totally psyched. Uh, sorry, I have my. I'm down in my basement, if that gives you a gist. <laughs> I'm down in my dungeon. Yeah. That doesn't sound uh, weird at all. Just, hold, just I, holding, I, holding, I, your, uh, holding your poodle with like a bucket draining into a, a fucking hole. Whoa! whoa. <laughs> <laughs> That's dark. Uh, yeah. no, it's, it's, just, just, it's cold, so I got blankets and hoodies. So I gotta, I'm getting hot now because I'm all embarrassed. But um, So, about... <laughs> oh, jeez. About me. Uh, so yeah, I, like I just about everybody. I never thought I could get into games. I mean, you know, you always like, oh, that'd be cool if. And this was this was before there was even really dedicated school. I mean, there's Art Institute, right? And that's that was always sort of there, but I couldn't afford any kind of private. So I just did a, a college typical uh, state school and went for you know. So my parents didn't think I was crazy. I went for you know, commercial art, as they called it, which <laughs> who knows what that meant. And um, and at that time, just went to college and did the four-year. Uh, and all the while, like, the it was Seattle time, so it was like, you know, dot-com era was, 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 get, was like the thing to do. So I was, I was making websites, but my websites sucked. <laughs> I mean, they were, they were like more interactive, crazy. They were basically like wannabe if I could make a game, but I can't code. So I'm going to take actions, well, not even action script, but just like flash and tween a bunch of stupid shit. Mm-hmm. And, and, and did that uh, to the point where I was like, all right, even my, my best friend growing up was like, you need to be doing 3D. And uh, I was like, well, how the, how the hell do I do that? And I thought it was impossible. And so once I got out of college and I started deciding to realize that this, you know, website crap isn't for me, um, uh, you know, I should get into games. And, and really the only way I could do it was there was a community college course at Seattle Central or Seattle whatever city central community college. And it was like 400 bucks on, and it was a C- ex-Sierra guy who was teaching you to make a character. And so I started from that and, and I went and took that class and I and I got that, and then the book. Um, God, what was the book by the guy? Fuck the Paul, Paul Steed. Steed. The Paul Steed book. Like, I mean, that was it. Like, I said, dude, you, this was the days. Like, for anybody who's listening, right? Like, this was the days when, like, the internet pretty much still sucked, and you could. I mean, there was there was poly count for some things, but poly count to me was still like totally intimidating, and 
I was like, ah, you know, and, and it was still very, I'm going to, I'm, I got to keep my secrets to myself style. Mm -hmm. It's still, I mean, it wasn't this like hyper sharing like you have now. And I would go to Barnes and Noble and I would literally look at books and, and flip through them. And most of the time it was like NURBS and I was like, who uses this shit? And I, went, I, need, I need polygons, I need triangles and all that. So I took that book and took this course and uh, a lot of the kids, the guys who were in there were uh, kind of like me, like trying to figure out what they were trying to do. And at that point, I, I had pretty much gotten close to hitting rock bottom, so I, you know, I, I had, I had uh, done this dot com crap for a while. Moved out, was living in the Capitol Hill area. Was trying to be sort of this rock star, like synth pop guy. Yeah, I said that, <laughs> and was like trying to do that. So I, I was, I, I was right with the original hipster thing. <laughs> oh god! <laughs> but I, I was trying to be like <laughs> so embarrassing. But I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be transparent. I'm going to tell you everything. So that's what I was doing, and I was. Living with this guy from Turkey, I was like, "Yeah, we're gonna do this," and and realized, no, I really actually want to do games, and I and I always wanted to do it, and I still want to do it, and but to do that, I had to basically, you know, live and breathe it. So a lot of the time I was spending was just sitting on my ass in front of the computer, and you know, got in a car like a mild like fender bender thing that I had decided to pay off with my own cash, so I was poor on cash, I had to move back home. So at this point, I'm at home now like in my mid-twenties, and it's like, oh, shit, like, what am I doing? And my girlfriend at the time, bless her heart, is like, I don't know, now my wife, like, is like, I don't know what she was thinking because here's this guy who's like, I'm going to get into this industry that's making video games, and I'm going to make the art for it, which there's no other way to do it other than sitting at home and posting my work on forums, mm -hmm. and I promise you I'll get a job. And, like, try and tell my parents that, and they got to the point where they were like, okay, you need you need to be making some kind of income. And so at that point, I took like probably the job that was the job that if I didn't take that job, I probably would never make it, right? Because it was so bad. It wasn't a terrible job, but I was working at my high school pulling weeds. It was the like the <laughs> summer, <laughs> the summer <laughs> job of like, of, and I remember, I got, I still tell my wife this every once in a while, it's like, what were you, I mean, seriously, what was going through your mind? Here's this guy you met in college that like, I would think, you know, is dashing and awesome, but whatever. And mm -hmm. here I am, like, tr like pitching this this story of I'm going to go into games by, like, making this art, and there's these people online, and I would occasionally, like, people would be like, oh, hey, I remember going to one interview, and they had told me, like, spun up this thing, oh, we're going to get you this, this, this job, and you're going to get all the stuff, you do this art test. So I was doing these art tests, and I'd be up to, like, three, four, five, six, or all-nighters on these things. And then nothing would happen, and they'd be like, you know, what was going on? And so <clears throat> I did that for a long time. And then, then the art test started sort of arriving. And though that, to me, was kind of a pivotal change where before it was, I was just making art with this, this kind of this, well, at the class at the time, and then I was at home and just making art, right? So it was, I had a, some random guy kind of, uh, who I'm actually still friends with, pinged me and said, hey, um, you know, and literally the email was, was hey, and I'm like, okay, what what is this? Could be spam or some prince from Nigeria, and so I email him back, and I'm like, <laughs> what do you want? And he's like, well, I'm making this RTS game, and so I started helping him. I was making robots, and so I was making, you know, like any of us back in the day, like I had to do everything, so I just sort of figure out how to animate using physique and biped, and like, I mean, nice. just, just, nice. just, just That's yeah, some good stuff. stuff. I mean, physique was like guaranteed to break. That's that's all. It, there was like there was nothing else. <clears throat> so I'd use that with my Paul Steed book as I'd flip through pages and talk with sort of random people on the on the forums. And at this point I was using I think CG Talk or CG Society it wasn't even Polycount or CG Chat. So I was using that their game art which was this tiny minuscule little group of people. And at that point I started branching out into Polycount a little bit and I remember posting some stuff and then I, uh, like, I met, um, I'm trying to remember, so I, I did a CG talk contest, which was, like, make a, a, a great character that you did from, like, an old Nintendo or, like, old classic game, bring him to new. So I did, <clears throat> I did, um, I think it was either, oh, my God, I can't even think back. It was either the Beast Rider competition or it was this, I made Kane from Final Fantasy 2. And so, or for us, it was, what, 4? And um, 
And I did that, and I did it all gothic and cool. And like then at the time, I was like, I don't need normal maps. I can hand paint these butt maps. And so I thought I was all, you know, because normal mapping was terrifying. And it was like so cutting edge at the time that you could at least make a height map and, and do it that way. Mm-hmm. So I did that, and, and I somehow got, like Ben Mathis and I somehow got into talking. And he basically put in a word for me at, I believe, both like Terminal Reality reached out to me, and then Iron Lore reached out to me. And Iron Lore had a terrible website. I mean, it was like embarrassingly bad looking. And I remember looking at it going, oh, God, I want to apply there. Like, and I was, at that point, I decided, after canvassing all of Seattle, there was really, there was really like, like no one would talk to me. Because in Washington State, it's very contract driven, and it's very hard to even get in. You have to sort of go through contractors and, or recruiters, and recruiters tend to be like, Where's your high poly art? And you're like, well, I make game art. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's like, where's your crazy high poly art that looks all cool and awesome but would never go in a game? And you're <laughs> like, you don't even know what we're making. And so there was a lot of these hurdles and, and gates I felt you had to jump through. But the minute that I went outside of state, it was just like, boom. Like, mm-hmm. it just felt like there was a lot. I could talk to a lot more people. And and I found the smaller companies, you know, like the thirty to sixty people companies, you know, small, um, were were way like you could actually get a hold of somebody, and so for me, you know, there's there's the Iron Lore and um, <clears throat> and Terminal Reality that sort of kind of cropped up out of nowhere when I was doing the art test, and lo and behold, like they kind you know you would talk to these companies, they would be like, yeah, we're interested, but it's only like going to be like it's gonna be like three months out, four months out, and you're like, oh, okay, great, I'll stay on it. Or I remember I talked with Factor Five for like forever and I thought I, I, I was so thought I was going to get that and I was like just dying to get in and a lot of time it was you know somebody was just had been in the industry they knew who had just been laid off and lived in the area and it was just an easier hire mm-hmm. so with with me it came down to like somehow both Terminal and Iron Lore were, were psyched and I went back and f- like I just got into this like 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 I don't know it just fell in my lap where here I have these two companies and they're like hey you know we, we both want you and I couldn't even believe it. So I really liked Iron Lore because I was just all about Diablo 2. I mean, the fact that I even graduated college is amazing because I played <laughs> Diablo 2 way, way, way too much. And uh, I just felt like that was sort of this, this company that, you know, I'm going to take a risk. I might as well just go all in. And, and Terminal Reality was also, I mean, I was all about that too. It was a character art position. Iron Lords was more just like kind of blanket artist, like you get to do a little of everything. There'd be obviously character art, lots of characters to make, but there's also weapons and environments and other stuff. And Terminality was like, well, it's it was like a movie game. I think it was like a spy hunter game that they were making, and <clears throat> so I had to make The Rock as the test. I mean, it actually known as Dwayne Johnson now, or whatever his name is. But <laughs> so uh, I went ahead and did that, and they got back to me. And the weird thing that I didn't like was that they were like, well, we'll just fly you out and you'll start. Like, there was no interview. The interview was just a phone interview. I'm like, wait, what? Like, that's, that seems like you want me just to move to Texas, and I've never met you face-to-face. Wow. And, and that, to me, was sort of this just, just enough, like, where if I had no other options, like, I, oh, hell yeah, I'm there. Like, fly me out. Um, but I lucked out, and, and the Iron Lord guys I flew out and met and, uh, and just and took that jump. So that was really my first, I mean, really my first game game job. I mean, prior to that, I, I sort of hopped where I did this, like, Seats 3D thing where, um, like, from my, from my pulling weeds job, I got this, um, uh, uh, I somehow had a friend of a friend got me into doing, like, contract QA with Nintendo. So I was, like, playtesting at Nintendo for a while, and that was, that was cool. And then from there, I did, like, th- Seats 3D, which was this, like, basically doing... Um, stadiums, where I was modeling stadiums, so I was pretty much falling asleep all the time because I was doing all this game contest stuff in the, in the off hours. Mm-hmm. And then that pretty much, like I said, yeah, I've, I've had some wine now, so follow me along. But basically that got me to, <laughs> to Iron Lore. So, <laughs> so, so yeah, so I mean, when I was at Iron Lore, that was really, I mean, and, and, and really Iron Lore, when you look at it, it's um, a lot has, has come out from there. I mean, you obviously, like, I mean, Boba worked there, Josh Singh worked there, Joe Mirabello worked there. And I can I can name drop for forever, but the reason I'm I'm name dropping these people is like like Joe Mirabella went and made Tower Guns. I mean Arthur Bruno was the lead designer now, just released Grim Dawn. Mm-hmm. Um, Stefan Sherman was an engineer that went and did, and now is uh, I think CCO or basically one of the co-founders on Vainglory. 
And then Max McGuire was the engineer guy, and now he's natural selection too. He's one of the co-founders of um, Unknown Worlds. So, and I'm sure I'm missing somebody or many people out of that group. But oh, and Ian Fraser is running Mass Effect Four. Like it's just it's crazy out of that group of people. And Bryn Bennett just did um, Flame in the Flood. So it's like it's, it's, a, it's a crazy, real. A crazy team. Yeah, and it's I mean really I, I mean Gav I mean you worked in in Boston obviously I mean I know you were crazy about the Boston area but like. <laughs> That that sort of group of devs, it's it's crazy, like how mm-hmm. much comes out of of that East Coast kind of Boston scene. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, I mean, titles alone, like just in like a very small, concentrated area, is crazy, you know. And there's not really a lot around, you know what I mean? I oh. guess like the closest hub might be like Montreal, maybe. But and I don't know yeah. what if it's if it's that because of that, because you don't have this constant like, because when I was in San Francisco, it was just constant like you know LinkedIn recruiters or, or mm-hmm. people hitting you up for jobs and so it's just like kid in a candy store you can't control like every six months people are bouncing around but in Boston mm-hmm. there's there's obviously fewer um, game devs especially after sort of the I would call it like the the massive implosion that happened uh, mm-hmm. around like 38 studios time yeah but yeah uh, but it's uh, I mean one thing I noticed from like the difference between Boston and, I mean, Vancouver or Los Angeles is, um, but Boston seemed very tribal in a way. Yeah. Like, you're, the, like, the irrational people or, like, your harmonics or you're, like, turbine or whatever, and you just kind of, like, stick to that, right? Yeah. I mean, I yeah. think I was saying, like, last podcast that, you know, irrational was the first time that I met somebody who worked somewhere for more than, like, five years. You know what I mean? Like, they were there forever, right? So, oh, for uh, sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, harmonics. Crazy. When I took my, so I went from Iron Lore to uh, harmonics, and and Iron Lore was, I mean, Iron Lore was rough because like that to me was my first game job, and like, I mean, there's so many awesome people there, and it was, it really was this this great dev team, and to be able to work on that game, where I did and touched pretty much everything from an art perspective. I mean, I did. Um, I, I, I mean, I did a lot of the characters, but I did a lot of the environment stuff and a lot of the tech environment. So I sat right next to the lead in, engineer, and so I would constantly just bounce off and stay super late because for the first six months, my fiance at the time had moved out. So I was like, well, what else am I going to do? I mean, this is why I'm here. So I made, so I just would stay until like I'd sleep over at the place all the time, mm-hmm. and it was almost like a kind of college environment where you had all these people that were finally getting their opportunity to to get to work on a game that wasn't, that really had a lot of freedom. I mean, there were some, I mean, we had a publisher and we had some gates that we had to stay within, some boundaries. But, I mean, there was a lot of freedom that we had at the time to, you know, looking back, especially just to throw throw around ideas. And you had a lot of, I mean, we lucked out. We had a lot of people from Turbine that had made, you know, huge games like MMOs that, that could at least help us, guide us to make get the most bang for our buck out of our art because we weren't mm-hmm. a huge team but we were like a really hungry team that was able to do um, do tons of stuff and so you know coming out of that like I was like alright well we almost had it I and mean, we had this this pitch called Black Legion I really thought like we would be crazy not to pick it up it was basically like a Gears of War meets RPG like ARPG type game it was freaking awesome and I was mm-hmm. super psyched but it didn't it didn't happen and um, I had to figure out what I wanted to do next, and at the time, uh, Arthur, who who's, does Crate Entertainment, was setting up Crate and was like, do you want to do this? And I was kind of on the fence, and I was like, well, I, I really want to see how a big, successful company works. Like, I feel like I've only, this is my first game job, like, legitimate game job outside of, like, really contracting to Nintendo for a little while, you know, which was just playtesting. It wasn't really seeing how, how all of this comes about. I want to go to a, a company that maybe can... Um, you know, show me how, or you know, how maybe it is successful. Like, what what did Iron Lore miss out on that maybe some other studio knows, so mm-hmm. I can learn. And so I talked to a couple of different companies, and I remember um, it, uh, Harmonics basically was the one that that I was like, wow, you know, this seems like a totally different take. And for me, like, I was getting very comfortable in the kind of art style I was working in and this was such a radical departure from what I was working on that it seemed like a, an interesting fit like I learned something out of it and so at that point you know I, I signed on and, and, and pretty much I told you know at the time 
part there. I was like, well, if they hit, if they kind of come in where I where I need to be, I, I take it. So I did that, and and that was that was awesome. Like that's what we talk about. Like, I mean, people that have worked in game companies. I mean, that place has been around for close to 15, 20 years now. Mm-hmm. And when I was there, I think they were at their ten to fifteen. I mean, they were there for years, and so you'd you know they they were tight, really tight in terms of um, at least community and sort of their culture. So uh, for them, it was all a lot of culture fit, and you know, I don't want to talk about how they hired, but but when they hired me on, I you know I felt it was part partly because of of what I brought to the table, sort of coming from more of like a I want to say like like a bit more of the tech end of of where the art was. I mean, normal mapping was still this crazy new thing, mm-hmm. and um, and from them, though, I learned a lot about just you know, how to make games look good without having all that stuff. Because in a lot of ways, their games look, have a very nice style and um, one that is about style. It's not about all the bangs and, you know, all the whistles and, and bells and everything. So stayed there for a while. Um, and for, for me, it was, I wanted to, I mean, I had a kid at the time and we realized we were both driving out to Boston, my wife and I, and we needed, I needed to be back at, um, uh, back at, close to home, if something were to happen, and some of the Iron Lord guys were starting another studio up, and that was called Tencent Boston, and they were making an MMO for like the Chinese market, and I was like, wow, you know, kind of getting back into you know adventure fantasy type stuff, and with the twist of sort of like an anime kind of style, and I, I like that style a lot, so I was like, well, that'd be awesome, you know, I could go back to that, and I'd be, you know, a stone's throw if my, because we were going to put my son in daycare, so I could, I could kind of be the guy that's close to the family, close to the house, so, I mean, it was, it was a bummer leaving, leaving that, but at the same time, they, you know, I released the Beatles, I worked on that, which was a big game, and then, um, with that, it was like track packs and lots of other stuff, so it did it, become more of, you know, I knew what to expect out of that job, and wanted another challenge and so this would be a lead character position mm-hmm. and I was like okay well that we'll see what that that entails but really it was to get back with a lot of the people from Ironmore um, and I wanted to get back into that kind of smaller group um, lean and mean type development and that was that was an eye-opener because coming back to that oh that was rough I mean you had a, a team in 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 the East Coast working with a team, a sister studio, not like an outsource team, but a sister studio in in Shanghai, China, and it was literally like twelve hour time difference. So it was it was it was brutal. And you're trying to make an MO and good lord, I mean, MOs are already hard enough. And <clears throat> and then add on to the fact that you're trying to make it for a, that, an audience that isn't your audience. So pretty much everything that we think on the Western side is cool pretty much isn't cool in China. <laughs> and I mean, I, I, it's the truth. It's like, or if you try to be like, oh, you know, I mean, for one thing, it was like, you know, our, our women shouldn't, you know, should look a certain way. And it's like in China, it's almost, it's, it's all about like, you know, dresses and very sexy clothing. And you know, they kept trying to tell us that. And we were like, no, no, we don't want to do that. And and <laughs> when we went to, you know, when I went to Shanghai, you go walk around the mall, and you're like, no, this is this is literally the outfits that you'll see people wear in the mall. Like this is this is totally what they want to see. Mm-hmm. And and also just kind of the prince, um, proper print style. So like RPGs in the West, you tend to start like homeless, like this homeless, like I got nothing, and then it's very capitalist, right? Then you build yourself up and work yourself up to this like the king, right? And partially, I think, it also has to do with F- uh, free to play games. But the, Ch- the games we were dealing with in China at the time, it was no, you start out looking beautiful and awesome, and you just continue to be beautiful and awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for us, we were like, "Wait, no! You have to be kind of gross and ugly, and and like wearing like a a nap, you know, just a freaking burlap sack, you know? Like that's mm-hmm. that's how you should start." And so we we had to work around that a lot. And and part of it was getting our end on on board, as well as just even like, you know, just getting a, just an understanding of even what is what is nice and what is pretty. I mean, mm-hmm. We were making our monsters ugly and gross because we like to kill ugly and gross monsters and feedback we'd get <clears throat> from China was, was, was we don't want to kill ugly things it's sad like why are we killing like this tree or whatever we had that was limping it was like why are you killing this <laughs> tree it's sad it's limping and we're like no it's a monster freaking kill it like it needs to die so yeah. there's a lot there's a lot of a lot of that and that was so that that was I don't know I mean that was an experience to say the yeah. least I learned a lot in terms of just dealing with 
I mean, you could say it's outsourced or studios, but just dealing from a re remote location, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you would you would develop for 12 hours on something, and then throw it over a fence, and then hear 12 hours later that it sucks, and it was it was rough, or it was awesome. You know, you wouldn't know. Then you have to deal with just even internal politics. So it was it was a I learned a lot working there and saw sort of the worst of the worst and to me seeing that you can come out of that. And so the coming out of that, while well, some people maybe on that team may disagree, was, was when we moved to Stomp Games. And at that point we shifted from being that project to being an internal top-down like Diablo 2 style game using the Unity engine. So that was sort of when I jumped into the Unity engine and started realizing like, hey, this is, and I had been practicing and sort of playing around with it since Harmonix days. But at this point I was like, hey, it's, I think this is, we could use this and we, you know, we, we're good at art. We can make this look really good. <clears throat> so at that point we kind of got swept under the Western wing, which made way more sense. So now we're a Western team making games for Western audience and made a game that, uh, you know, got some accolades for being really pretty and being awesome. But at the end of the day, like, for me, like, design-wise and, and just sort of overall kind of free-to-play games, it was it was your typical, like, oh, there's an energy component, you know, when are you going to pay? Mm -hmm. And it, it was that. And so, you know, I, I loved it for the fact of what we were able to accomplish from, like, a technical standpoint. Like, we were making monsters with... I mean, in props to, like, I mean, the concept artist, like, Rafe was our concept artist in, I mean, working with the absolute absurd restrictions of, like, hey, make this ama amazing monster and you have, like, six bones. <laughs> and and we make it. He makes centipedes. And we would figure out a way to, like, make it animate and make it work. And we made uh, bipeds with, like, nine bones. And so we learned, I, I've learned a lot where, you know, we, the animations were good, too. So it was, you know, when I hear animators, like, oh, I need an extra bone, I'm sort of, just like, like, fuck you, like, I've made monsters with nine bones, so mm -hmm. don't, don't tell me you need, like, that 76 bones aren't enough, like, you, you should, be, if you, if you, you know, it, it's, I run into that quite a bit, where, where people will think they need, they need that extra thing, and you're like, dude, if you make games long enough, like, you should be, you know, that extra bone should make it better, but you should be able to make it awesome with, you know, X, be mm -hmm. nine bones or ten bones, or however many, from a technical standpoint. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, from, from that, um, once that sort of imploded, I realized and I sort of looked and I'm sure, you know, I looked at Irrational. Irrational had 300 people. There were six <laughs> months past due on, on, and I just looked at the numbers and was realizing... Those, those were a good six months, though. Yeah. Oh, but I mean, <laughs> realizing, like, I'm sure they were. <laughs> realizing, like, uh, you know, it's going to happen. I mean, 38 had already, had already imploded and um, was kind of looking at, like, We'd been what I told my my brother, you know. Oh, we'll be we'll be in Boston for two years and we'll move back. It would have been seven years, nine years at this point, and was like, okay, I need to get back to the West Coast. And that's where my family is. A lot of stuff had gone down, in, you know, within my wife and my family, and I and missed out on a lot of that. And I wanted to get back. So, at that point, um, I started looking and sort of canvassing and realizing like what I've been doing. Well, I now sort of not really pigeoned my hold myself, but gotten into the situation where I was when I was at. Stomp Games, I'd become sort of a product owner, which at that time meant, like, I oversaw... It was basically still a lead character artist, but I oversaw a little bit more. So I saw animation and, uh, for the characters, items, progression, a lot of the, you know, item tracking, but also some of the creation. So, like, I was still what I would consider lead character artist, but for the game, I was in charge of all things, like, monster-based, I guess. And um, was like, okay, you know, maybe I can take that and, and use that you know, when I look at a lot of these really shitty free-to-play games that I'm seeing on the market. And one of the game companies we kept looking at that was making money, that was actually a sustainable business, was, was KickSize. So I was like, hey, you know, I'll talk with them. And so I talked with them, and they seemed like they knew what they were doing. So I was like, all right, cool. Like, I'll give that a shot, and came out over there. And within, like, a first month of, there, of working there, the, um, the game I was on was paused, and I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> and uh, I got moved on to a game that I probably never would have flown over for. Um, and it was, a, like, at the time, it was like a 2D game that was sprite-based. And I was like, oh, my God, you know, mm -hmm. what have I gotten myself into? Here I was, like, really pushing myself as kind of pushing what Unity could do in a Facebook slash mobile sense. Like, like I knew what next-gen games could do. I knew that tech. But I also knew how to make how to push it because I had never really done 
the hyper hyper PBR stuff. I was doing more of that, like, hey, you know, you can make a high res model, bake out an AO, and paint over the AO, and then sort of blend in a normal map with some spec, and it, it'll look good, you know, with with the three point or dynamic lighting we have. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, all right, I, I can do that. And I got, you know, I've done some um, some management where I, you know, I can get projects out the door, and 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 let's see how this works. And so when I got there and got into that project, it was. Um, I had to really use a lot of the stuff I had actually learned at Tencent from the Shanghai guys, which they were kind of subversive in a lot of the ways they had done stuff. And I'm not proud of it, but the team in a lot of ways was was uh, um, you know not willing to want to push it. Right? They felt that the 2D was good enough when we get out to market. I'm like, this is a rat race, man. Like, this is consoles all over again. Like, we have to we have to be the best on the best in show. Like, the market was was maturing, so. Uh, at that point, um, uh, you know, I, I kind of took it upon myself to take the game home and threw in a bunch of 3D meshes and proved, like, this will shit will run on these devices and probably pissed off some tech directors and, and mm -hmm. to make my point, but started winning over a lot of people within the team that were, I think, frustrated that wanted it to be that. Um, but also it's a business, and I understand that, and you don't want to piss off the hand, the hand that feeds. You know, they're mm -hmm. trying to get the game out to make it profitable. But at the same time, I realized, like, it's not going to be profitable looking this way because I know what's coming, right? You can't look out at what's now. You have to think, well, what's the team that's been working on this game, on, a, on another game for a year and a half and is going to, you know, announce in six months? It's going to eclipse what's happening right now. So I was trying to think in that mindset. And um, so, yeah, I mean, we start, slowly started winning it in terms of the team and building the team to get them excited about what it could be. And slowly but surely got it to position where we were doing a full 3D, getting it fully sexed up and looking awesome. And, I mean, it was a roller coaster. Uh, I, I think the game may be out now or is, is soon to be out. Um, but along the way, you know, I got to work with, you know, Kicks I was smart and hired smart people, and they brought in um, a guy named Luke Castle, uh, who was, you know, RTS mastermind who came in and did um, Dune 2 and a bunch of other great games and so I got to meet and work with him and so when it was for me in time to be like okay I've sort of put in all I can on this um, some you know some friend of mine that I worked with we were talking about VR and that excited me and they lucked out and um, had a really awesome looking game and so I said look I, I want to jump in on this and started working with them but all the while you know, throughout my entire industry, my entire career, I've always had like a plan B, right, or a plan C. Mm -hmm. And so, all the while, like like art tests were a big thing I always did, or um, like Grim Dawn for a long time was sort of my plan B. Um, I was helping Arthur a lot on that. And then um, uh, when I moved to the, um, when I was at Tencent Boston for a while, I was working on another little side project with some friends. Always like if if the shit hit the fan, I could at least do this. Mm -hmm. And so when I was, um, you know, doing some other stuff, I realized, you know, met with this, some two of my buddies, and we started talking and uh, realized, hey, you know, this is something we can do. Um, and we knew Unity and um, started working on it. And we worked on it for uh, kind of about a year and a half or so and got to a point where it was um, not really do or die for us, but, like, what are we doing? Like, why are we staying up these crazy hours? And we should at least, um, and it was nice to at least from a VR company to, to say, hey, I'm working on this. Is that cool? And they're like, that's cool. Like, and, and, like, I agree, too. Like, I felt, too, like it wasn't never supposed to be my full-time job. It was just, like, a what if or maybe I can work on this and, and may, maybe, you know, put it out to, like, a couple people and mm -hmm. get a sweet little, like, bonus check out of this. Um, and so we were like, well, let's, let's just throw a trailer out and see, see what comes of it. And so we were like, all right, let's 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 spin up a little trailer because a lot of the tech that we still needed to do had to be done. And, you know, that's... I'm just making some of the characters and sort of the design and, and some of the kind of overall feel of it. But, you know, there's a lot of work that has to be done. So if we at least sort of encapsulate it in a trailer, you know, maybe people like it and we'll keep working on it. And so we threw that out. And that's kind of where I'm at now where, like, it fucking went crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, we were not expecting any of that and had to really, you know, it sucked because the, you know, the VR place I was at, I, dude, that was like pretty much I had hit the perfect job where mm -hmm. 
at that place, I'm, you know, it's a small team, and, like, I mean, it's flat as you can expect. Like, there was no, like, oh, I, you know, empire building or pissing matches. It was, like, what what's cool? Let's make cool shit. And we just made it. And it was, I was, I mean, it was perfect. I came to work, and people were, like, well, what do you think of your new job? I mean, after, like, your three to six months, you know, it's, like, oh, you know, this or that. I was, like, no, I love this. Like, I, I, I couldn't have asked for anything more. So it was, like, this bittersweet moment where I was, like, I'm coming into work at my awesome job that I love, and at the same time, like, I'm fielding on my phone at lunch, like, tons of emails and everything else about this other thing I'm working on that I also love, but potentially could change my life. You know, this is sort of the life-changing thing for me in a lot of ways because the plan was, obviously, we couldn't survive in San Francisco off of, you know, going sort of all in on this. And so I pitched them, hey, we can go up to Seattle, where I grew up, where my family is, and make this happen. So, um, and that's kind of where we're at now. So January, um, January, February time, we started the move. And for me, it was like February 1st, you know, moved up here and have been for the last, what is it, last month, been full time. And it's awesome. I mean, it's it's weird. It's bizarre. I've never done, I mean, I've done like freelancing, <laughs> but mm -hmm. I've never done where, like this, where like I get up and I, my work is coming down and making giant boss monsters and, you know, <laughs> figuring out shit. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's That's crazy. Awesome, though, man. For sure. Yeah. Can I, can I, can I ask, man, like, what, what was going through your mind, like, right at that moment when you decided, you know what, fuck it, we're going to do this, we're going to, like, jump in, like, what was the thing, or what were the things that made you go, yep, this is it, let's do this? So, I mean, I think, I think when we, I mean, you always think, like, whenever you're doing something, and it's all secretive, and it's all sort of, like, the three or two or three of you, like, we were thinking... Okay, we're going to put this out. I was creating this press kit, because we kind of did this other little pitch of this a sm much, much smaller game, and, like, way back when, it was called... It's an older game called Moonbase Commander, and we made this little, I mean, other game, and it was called Kingdom Commander, and it was sort of... We were going to put it on mobile, and we thought, like, this, it was going to be huge, and we thought... And nothing came from it. It just... I mean, it, I mean we got, like... I, and I sought out... I went on forums, and I found posts from, like... 10 years ago, and I would find their email addresses and email those people and be like, hey, we're making this sort of game that's like that, that's sort of bringing it back, because you know, it's a great game, just no one ever played it. So I had that in the back of my head the whole time, that like, this is just this all over again, and no one's going to give a shit, and you know, we'll be lucky if we get a thousand views on YouTube. Like, cause I'm, I'm freaking YouTube illiterate, like, I'm, I don't, I mean, I barely know this, like, social media shit outside <laughs> of, like, posting pics on Facebook. I mean, <laughs> and, and liking, like, posts that you guys put. Like, that's pretty much it. And um, and so when we decided, like, I mean, when we decided it was, it was uh, God, I, I mean, because it all happened, like, really over a weekend. I mean, where, where we were like, I, I think we need to do this. But when we released it on, like, a Thursday or Wednesday night or something, we put it out there, and it was, I mean, it was like a typical video. It's like one or two people, thing of three or four. The view counts, like, at 100. And then I think Tim or Chen, uh, my two partners, like, put that up on Facebook. And I was terrified because I didn't want to, like, piss off my work. I mean, even though they knew I was working on it, I didn't want to, like, be self-promoting when I'm still working in my other jobs that, like, I love. And, and I was like, okay, I, I should, I mean, I should at least, and I told them, I was like, hey, here's this video we did. Like, I, I told you we are going to do this, this kind of trailer first, and, Here's what it is. And like, oh, it's cool. Good job, dude. I'm like, sweet, thanks. And then it went from like 1,000 views, and then like next day it was like 10,000. And then like, I, I think it was Indie Gamer Girl. I remember watching like Twitter. Like, I never used Twitter before. And here I'm like looking at Twitter. I'm like, do I like this? How do I respond? <laughs> like, I don't know what I'm doing. And it started just going and going. And it was, it was totally exhilarating and like a, a massive high totally terrifying because at the same time I know, you know, we've made games, right? We know what what that means, right? You're like, oh shit, like we have to deliver, like this, mm -hmm. this, has, to, this has to happen. And instead of, you know, we also knew at that point, it's like, you know, we were doing part-time and we figured, okay, we could probably get this done in X amount of time part-time. Now it's like, okay, we got a full-time. What does that mean? And what does that mean? Like, yeah, we could keep developing forever on full-time, but it's also coming out of our own paycheck or savings or whatever. 
But at that time, it was it was never really like a fuck it, let's get out of here. It was more like, oh shit, like we have to make a decision. And I mean, I think maybe for Tim and Chen, it maybe was maybe it was easier for them. But for me, I'm like, I have this awesome job. I'm making this sweet, v, you know, VR stuff. Like I love this, but oh crap, like you, you know, it's it was, it was almost like I could see the positive and negatives of both. I mean, obviously, I love working on the game I'm working on. You know, I love this game. But at the same time, I love the excitement of coming into work and just getting to make cool shit, and it just goes in, and it's like VR is totally awesome. I mean, it's all it is, it's amazing. I love I love it. Um, but it was really around like I think we broke like a hundred thousand or something within like a day, and it was like Saturday. I'm sitting there at the park, and it's like, oh my god, we're gonna break 150. Okay, it'll die out after that. Oh, we're gonna break two. And this is just on a one and a half minute video, and then it was like on all these sites that like. I know what it takes to get on the sites, and it's usually like they have to pay money to get onto them, or do something that's, I mean, like re- absurd, or like have something that's special. And I'm like, oh shit, like this is it. Like this mm-hmm. is this is it. This is I. I mean, I either the train is leaving. I have to take this train. Like there, there's, I have to do this. And uh, yeah, and so it wasn't really. I mean, it's scary in the sense of like, okay, we gotta just move, um, and my wife has to get, you know, work <laughs> so, so we can afford to live. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't regret it at all. I mean, it's, and even if this totally is a piece of shit game or something or, or people hate it, like I would, you know, I, I regret would, if I never did this, I think it would be to my detriment. Like, and to do the same with my partners. I think we'd be kicking ourselves um, to not at least try. So, yeah. That's crazy, man. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Uh, wow. What do you think, like, uh, the biggest change of, like, your, I guess, mindset would be going from, like, studio work to doing your own your own thing? I mean, especially, like, doing your own thing in your basement. You know what I mean? Like, do you, <laughs> like, do you have to, like, I don't know, I guess force yourself to be uh, disciplined? Or, um, you know, is there, like, any, like, significant change to your, uh, I guess, routine or... You know, schedule. I think it's um. So I mean, I have I have two kids. So it's for me, it's a little more juggling during the day. And I have a great wife that's been incredibly support, supportive and helps. <clears throat> you know, with obviously bringing home money <laughs> um, to pay for a lot of things. Um, but for me, probably the biggest thing has been just waking up. Right. And it's not like oh, getting out of bed. It's it's sort of waking up and realizing like you don't have to go to work. Like there's no one that's there's no one that's going to tell you you're fired. It's it's the industry or the the market that's going to tell you you're fired, right? Like you didn't make a good enough product, so it's up to you, and it's up to you and your team to come up with what is the best thing. So there's a lot of decisions that we make during the day. I mean, I've, that I've always made at other companies. That and I mean, and to some credit, working in a mobile studio, you see this a lot, which is this may be we can get it to get perfect, but what is the priority for fun, or what is the priority to get this playable? You know, mm-hmm. and it's, I mean, they would always call it, like, in the mobile era, like, MVP, which was, like, minimum viable product. And I don't, I mean, I don't like that because that usually means you go to market with this, like, you know, half-assed, barely playable game. But from, like, when it's three people, it, it's more about, like, okay, well, what are the things we're trying to solve and how quickly can we solve those things? And as soon as we can solve those things, then we, you know, qualitate them, I guess, and make them look really good and, mm-hmm. and make sure they're awesome. So it's a lot about how fast can we prototype what we're thinking and how important are what we, because it's very quick, it's very also very expensive when you think about sort of the time you spend when you're sitting around talking about what's, you know, oh, I want to make this cool and you can deep dive on things that are really not necessary. Like where I may be bitching about, oh, the character has got this little hitch in their animation, and we'll go spend like 30 minutes talking about that. That's 30 minutes we could be talking about something that's way more important. So mm-hmm. that to me, you usually would have a producer, or you'd have somebody that would be like, shut up, get back to work, <laughs> or, or you wouldn't even be in those meetings, right? You'd be like, oh, like, I have to make you know, the orc look totally awesome for this game, or I have to make this item, or I have to make this, and you have your tasks and you have your due dates. We mm-hmm. really don't have, we, we have some internal due dates that we're working on that we're trying to hit for our own kind of, I guess, internal deadlines. But outside of that, I mean, there's no... We, we've, we're very lucky in the sense that uh, there's demand. We know there's demand, and it's about, for us, about getting something that 
I think people will be excited about, but not fucking that up. So that's, I mean, that's what keeps me up at night is like, I don't want to fuck this up. And I think when you're in in a studio, you 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 have those nights. You know, you, you know, at least when I was a lead, I'd have those nights of like, oh my god, like we're not going to get all of our stuff done on time. And it was more about just getting your stuff done to be to get it your sort of portion of the pie in. But this is like oh, hey, we have to get this fun, but then we have to get it, like, playable, and then we have to get it, like, saleable. And so there's a lot of things that uh, I'm sure we're not even ready for. <laughs> but mm-hmm. for now, I mean, that's, that's, I think, the biggest change is just waking up and not, you know, my commute is, like, taking my kids to school and then coming back down as fast as I can and getting into work mode as fast as I can. Because um, for me, my days are, like, like probably 8.30 to about 3, 4, because mm-hmm. my kids come home, and when they come home, like nothing gets done. Like I have a kid in my lap, and it's just like, they're like, Dad, let's do this. Oh. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, I'll see it like later on. So kids go to bed around like 7, 8, and then spend some time with my wife, say, hey, how was your day? And then start around like 10, and then go from 10 to about 2 to 3, and then rinse, repeat. Mm-hmm. And like that's just been... And that's how the, t- the three of us have been working anyways. And so for the other guys, I mean, they don't have to do that break at three or four, but they probably go to like five or six, mm-hmm. and then they do the same thing. But that's, I mean, that's pretty much, and then we do Tuesday, Thursdays, we have decided are sort of like our meetup. So we'll meet in the basement. Um, we have death, and so we'll meet <laughs> down here. And, and like, okay, and, and it's, it's amazing. It's actually worked really well because, because we've worked so long remotely, I think we've gotten really good at trusting each other and, and sort of getting used to internet chat, you know, like chatting, like, what does Brian mean when he's using all caps? You know, is he, like, <laughs> pissed? Or is he just, like, belligerently being stupid and silly? And, like, you get to you, you know, so you get used to each other through that kind of ability to talk. But then we'll still do hangouts when it's like, hey, we need to, you know, talk about a couple things. And then, really, the Tuesday, Thursdays have been much more, like, hey, we got to talk with, you know, we just did our operating agreement, which is like setting up a business. Like, hey, you know, you know what, what does that mean between three, three people? So we've set that up and, um, you know, we had to go get a desk. So we got together and drove out to Big Lots and got a desk or whatever. <laughs> and we were hitting Valley Village, man. Like we got to, Valley Village is like a freaking treasure trove if you hit like certain days. I was like, oh my God. We got whiteboards. We got coax cable. So we were... <laughs> We are doing it on the cheap. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. So the, man. so the so the team the team is is just the three of you guys right now. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's the three of us. Um, we have uh, a guy who's helping us with music, a guy that I know from college, uh, Ian Dorsch, who um, has who helps with the trailer music, um, which he would say is trailer music because um, he wants to make it much better than that. We you know the trailer was sort of. Uh, was interesting we were just like we have to get it out and we literally keyholed it through like in October which is crazy and I was telling the guys like to put that trailer out in October like this is lunacy like this is when all these huge games get announced and we literally slipped right before Halo 5 was all the next week Uh, Star Wars Awakens literally was like the end of that week and we were like and we just so happened which was fucking crazy was we announced the 10-year anniversary, basically 10-year anniversary of Shadow of the Colossus. And I mean, our game is obviously, you know, has some inspirations from that, and it's just like, we didn't plan that. It's like, what the... F- yeah, we just, like, announced. So, I mean, I think that's pretty cool. But, uh, yeah, so it's him and then another buddy of mine from college who's um, who's done a lot of sound on a bunch of games, works at Motiga right now, did harmonics before that, and so he's helping, he'll help us with some of the sound, and then... Um, animation has been like Mixamo a lot of it, like, believe it or not, mm-hmm. um, helped a lot. And then uh, right now we just um, got basically an animator um, that we're contracting with uh, who she worked, she's in Germany, and so she's helping us with a couple animations. Um, so basically animations are like our, our weakness if we're like, a, I don't know, an Avengers team or something. It's like, <laughs> or I guess if we're like a... a <laughs> Like a MMO team, right? We don't like we have like a warrior. We have like a we you know a bard or something, and we have uh, 
I don't know, fuck it, whatever an engineer would be, like an <laughs> amazing engineer, whatever class that is. But, but basically we're missing an animator. Clear, clearly and, wizard. Yeah, a wizard. Yes, a wizard. <laughs> um, and I, actually, I don't know who, I, don't, I said bard. I, I don't know if Tim wants to be called a bard. He probably more of a mage. He controls a lot of stuff. But, like, um, but yeah, I mean, we have this great team of three that does a lot of stuff. And I sort of bullshit animation when I can. Um, but we really, you know, that's probably our area of, of, of help that we need the most help in is animation. So we've been outs outsourcing or contracting animations when we need them. And other, usually I just, like, I'll just stub in a bunch of shit, um, and then we'll do it better. Mm -hmm. just, in uh, case, uh, just in case nobody knows what we're actually talking about, it's um, the game is Pray for the Gods. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah ever, uh, like, what uh, is he gonna say? It? Oh, okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> Google. Yeah. Sorry. Prayforthegods.com. Prayforthegods.com. Yeah. Oh, I'll I'll do all the hashtags at the end. Don't forget, yeah. guys. Like yeah, and yeah. subscribe. <laughs> at at pray for the gods. Follow us. <laughs> I'm actually just like a side note here. I don't really um, know how Twitter works all that well. I'm not too savvy in that area, and um, I've been so anti-hashtags since the whole social media thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, dude. I'm actually like kind of blown away at how crazy um, the system of hashtagging works. I, I just figured it out a few days ago, mm -hmm. so it's kind of ironic how now that I'm using it, <clears throat> I'm like kind of finding art that I'd never even imagined just via hashtags. I don't even understand how that works. I know that might sound super crazy, but damn, <laughs> hashtags. So Hashtag. actually, would you mind explaining? Because, I, uh, I mean, we hashtag things, and for the longest time, we just <laughs> would throw every fucking hashtag we could like at the wall and just be like, just hashtag everything until <laughs> it says we can't hashtag anymore. And then I read online, I went online, I'm like, hashtags means more links or follows. And it's like, yeah, don't do that. Put, like, two at most. I'm like, what? And apparently, yeah, like, if you put, like, two or less on Twitter, you get more retweets and follows mm -hmm. because I don't know if people oh, what? don't I didn't know that. that. Yeah, that was, like, this huge, like, a bunch of different articles said that, like, at the max two, you can do three, but you'll, you'll, there's a huge decline in your re retweeting and following from that. Mm-hmm. I think Dude, like, right, yeah. I, I love that. I love how we're all like Troy and I have been sort of researching how all this shit works, and now we're all like kind of <laughs> gathering together mm -hmm. and putting our info into a big box. And oh man, that's nuts! Yeah, all, all the old fogies like sitting around <laughs> going, "What the fuck <laughs> is all this internet a, hashtag Twitter? What the just a bunch of, uh, of chimps just banging at the obelisk, you know, <laughs> trying to figure it out." Throwing bananas <laughs> at the screen. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've been using like, Twitter for a while, man. But I mean, I didn't know the the rules of of hashtagging. I think I just kind of do it as like a like a organization thing, you know, mm -hmm. like some kind of way of splitting my uh, bullshit personal tweets <laughs> versus uh my uh, my work, you know. <laughs> It, it seems that it reaches more people, um, not via the amount of hashtagging, but picking things with whatever you're posting that is the most relevant. So if you if you did a 3D model of some orc, you'd be like, hashtag ZBrush, hashtag orc, hashtag mm -hmm. 3D. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And then somehow that those hashtags, in my mind, the way it works, don't quote me on this, it just like... This this line of information reaches random people in the universe mm -hmm. because you've used this hashtag, and yeah. then it gets eyes on whatever it is you've posted because you put 3D ZBrush yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, it kind of like files it into like if you did like man, I can't believe we're talking about hashtags, but if you like <laughs> if you if you did like ZBrush or something and people search for ZBrush, like yours would show up in that that feed, yeah, you know, yeah. and and you can start making like different you know, different feeds based on, you know, different categories and stuff. And they have, like, bots that'll pick up certain hashtags and, like, retweet it, like, a shit ton of times. So if you what? did, like, yeah, there's, like, you know, like, game dev, right? Yep. So there's, like, the game dev bot. And if you do, like, hashtag game dev, 
like you always get like three retweets because there's like a bunch of bots that are that are doing that. So you know. Holy shit! Dude. You know what? Yeah. Are they yeah, like legit bot bots? They just ZBrush bots out ZBrush hashtags. <laughs> yeah. Because there's game dev and there's indie game dev and there's like. I don't know if Screenshot Saturday... Like, that's, that, those are, like, our big ones, right? Like, oh, Screenshot Saturday. Um, but I don't know, like, about ZBrush stuff. If Or, uh, God, I don't, yeah, I don't really... I don't we, should, uh, we should make one. There we go. <laughs> you know, ZBot. ZBot. <laughs> ah, I guess that's pretty is good. Is there a 3D one? I'd imagine 3D is, like, bigger than ZBrush. So yeah, maybe there's a 3D bot? An art so. bot, maybe? Art bot? <laughs> Maybe. I don't even know what that is. I still don't get it. I don't understand what this bot is. <laughs> well, I feel good now because I, I, I thought I was the only one that was just <laughs> stumbling through through Twitter. Mm-hmm. Twitter's I like still don't get it. I, I I I think I like Twitter more than more than anything because it's just like very much a one way conversation, you know. <laughs> like in Facebook, like I'll find myself. Like just kind of scrolling, and I'm like, man, I don't fucking care. Like, I don't care about any of this shit. <laughs> and, uh, like, Twitter, it's like, man, eh, I don't know. Like, I can, like, search for things that I want, and, you know, it's, like, all very short, like, statements and stuff like that. So it's like, man, eh, it's, it's perfect for my uh, antisocial, um, you know, impatient mind, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I've kind of been... We were talking about this with some friends last night, and uh, Facebook sort of forces you to look at stuff that you didn't really ask for. It just sort mm-hmm. of re-jumbles your Facebook feed, uh-huh. like, randomly, yeah. like, here you go. Yeah. Um, but it seems like Instagram and Twitter are kind of cool because you can pick and choose, um, and that's what's going to be in your feed, period. Yeah, totally. totally. Yeah. And with, like, Twitter, I'm... Uh, uh, my news feed is hooked up to, like, Vancouver, like, in Canada, so I get all, like, Canadian topics, right? So but you get real news. Yeah, yeah, so none of it's like, <laughs> like, oh, like uh, fucking trending now, Trump is Hitler and stuff like that. It's like, no, nah, I don't fucking know. Like, I'm just a big to that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much, yeah. Yeah, well, pretty if much. It's trending, uh, if it's trending, it must be real, man. It must be real, right? I think, uh, uh, no, I think, no, not, not he's Hitler. I mean, is that uh, actually a trending hashtag right uh, now? I think, uh, like, Louis C.K. sent out something comparing him to Hitler or something like that. Oh, okay. I don't keep uh, up with that stuff. Well, wow. honestly, it's probably best that <laughs> we just went there. <laughs> it's, I mean, yeah, I mean, essentially, it's it's like idiocracy. The movie just coming to real life and slowly. Well, we're in New Zealand, so. Yeah, yeah, I know. I think I'm about think I'm about to retreat to the motherland. Honestly. <laughs> well, we got a spare bedroom. So, uh, there Sweet. You go. Yeah. Well, so we'll oh. uh, so me and Troy will cuddle up in one bed and. <laughs> No. Yeah, right, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah, the downstairs right. dungeon. Yeah, dude. That sounds good. Yeah. You know, we can't. You know, as an American, we can't apparently say ask for asylum in Canada. Oh, really? Not that I looked into it, but. <laughs> <laughs> not that I. Not that I immediately was googling it last week. <laughs> yeah, you, you were yeah, not, no, no. not partially responsible for that website going down, or like immigrate to Canada dot com or something. God. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so to to bring up your game again, because mm-hmm. I mean, I'm gonna be honest, I I didn't know about it. Um, That's awesome. So I'm looking at it. You found it, we found a new, uh, hopefully, a new fan. <laughs> oh yeah, I sorry, you said that was awesome that I didn't know about it. I didn't know how to feel about what you just said, but yes, now <laughs> you've got a, a new fan for sure. It's definitely um very Shadow of the Colossus-y kind mm-hmm. of. Um, and there's not many games out there that have kind of gone down the road of making these giant, epic creatures, and the size difference of the character and the player versus the enemies just fucking awesome. I really like what you guys have done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, when we when we, so when we when we went on a walk, so it was, it was Chen, Tim, and I, and we were <clears throat> we were kind of, I mean, we were working in our San Francisco jobs and stuff, and it was it was very free-to-play mobile type stuff. And I was looking, um, you know, was was like, what would it just happened? Oh, um, shit, Metal had just been announced on iOS. 
And that was sort of like, oh, yeah, like real games, like real 3D, and they were really pushing that. And I was like, God, you know, we could make something fucking cool, like in our spare time, just something crazy. And so we, we you know, I, we were like, let's let's talk, let's go, let's go have some coffee or something. So we went for a walk, and uh, you know, I was like, dude, we could we could just like fuck around, and make something cool with this. And you know, he was kind of like, kind of, what, what are you thinking? And like everybody that's in games has usually got something else going on, like some other little project of some kind, be it like a demo reel type thing or a full-on little mini game or just sweet art that they're selling as sculpts or whatever. And I was like, look, we can make something just really small. And he, you know, uh, Chen, who's the engineer, was kind of like, well, I'm thinking like Dynasty Warriors. I'm like, f- I'm like, fuck that. He's like, why? I'm like, well, oh. <laughs> well, it's not that I don't like Dynasty Warriors. That's a shit ton of work. Like, that's a lot of animation. That's a lot of character. He's like, no, no, no. It's like one character, and we just like duplicate a bunch of times. Like, eh. I'm like, dude, that's still a ton of animation because you have all the different characters. And so I was like really trying to scope it down. We're like, what could three people do? And I was like, you know, I've always just, like, if we can make one character versus one, and we'll, you know, one big boss, that would be, like, and we could make that really awesome and really sell that and make that really quality. And that was something that we learned from Tencent. When we worked in, in Tencent Boston, they were always, t- always kind of doing these pitches, and their pitches were like, it was all about their kind of pre-alpha, and their pre-alpha was like, look, if you can't make one character versus one monster fun, making one versus a thousand isn't going to be any better. Like, it's, it's, you, you know, if you can't make that good, like, why are you going to try to say that you can make one versus a thousand better? So, and that was sort of something we were hitting up against these MMOs, where these designers would be like, I need 454 weapons. And you're like, wait, 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 wait. Why do you need, like, well, you know, what, can you not make it fun with 50 weapons? And it's just sort of that idea of, like, that somehow quantity just somehow immediately means that it's more fun. And it's nice to see games getting much more, at least from an indie scene, kind of smaller. Not smaller in a sense of, like, that they're less better, but just I feel like that the quality isn't stretched out so thin for mm-hmm. this, this size of the team. And so at that time, I was like, look, let's, let's just focus on that. If we make that awesome, then we can start adding in lots of little things if we want. But let's focus on making that really special and really, I mean, at the time I used the word intimate, like where this is very intimate battle, and let's let's go for it. And so, yeah, obviously, when you look out there, like what other games that have really done that, and there's, it's really only, like, Shadow of Colossus, I think Lords of Shadows, like Castlevania Two, did it, like, barely. God of War kind of does it, but they do it in a really kind of gimmicky way, um, where you're just, like, tapping X now. It's very Dragon's Lair, mm-hmm. like, if you ever play Dragon's Lair, where it's like, press left, mm-hmm. oh, you failed, you get the death animation. Um, so, you know, that was um, what we started spinning up on. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> kind of went off on a tangent. No, oh, yeah, I, I, that's awesome. I think, um, you know, Troy and I, Troy and I always talk about uh, how games have kind of been changing, and it's really tough, especially now in the kind of next-gen era, to find games that you can really relate to and really kind of fall in love with because the complexity is just so high. And, you know, we were watching some Twitch streams not too long ago and kind of remembering how simple old games were. Um and if someone could just take that simplicity and put it into a next-gen state, it would do really well. Um, yeah, so I think it seems think that that's what you guys have done. Yeah, I was gonna say like um, for me, one of the games that really stood out is like more, and it was it was really recent. Um, I got a PS4, and I was like, oh hey, I have a PS4 now. And guys, I was working with were like, you really should play Journey, and. I never played it, and I was like, I remember talking with one of the art directors uh, at Kickside, and he was like, oh, that's my favorite game, and I was like, I don't, I remember seeing that, I remember hearing about it, and I played it, and I was like, you know, it's, it's yeah, it's very linear, it's, it's very um, short, but at the same time, it's incredibly well done, and I wanted to play it again, and I remember playing, for me, when I was growing up, my favorite game, at least when I was a really, like, a little kid, when I had a Nintendo was Super Mario 2. And yeah, that's yeah. like the like Dude, that's the, the, best the Mario. fake the fake no, Mario. No, 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 but it's fuck fucking that. awesome. It's like, the best port? one. It's thank you God. Someone Definitely else. The best one. It's the the fucking ass to Subcon, trip Super dude. Mario. It's cool. Yes. And it was I mean, <laughs> I mean it was it was sort of a uh, I mean, the wind kind of got knocked out of my sails when I heard it was this other game and they just, like, slapped Mario on it. I was like, oh, fuck that. But at the same time, I was like, I don't care. I love that game. And the reason I loved that game was I would play through it daily. 
I would just mm -hmm. play it to beat it. And I could beat it within a day, and I could beat it to the point where I remember mapping out how can I make it so every single person at the end is a contributor? So I would map out the entire game, figure out all the warps, and figure out who I had to play as each character. Mm -hmm. So I'd be like, oh, I have to be like Mario on 6-2 or whatever the level was, and Toad on these levels, and Princess on these levels, so everybody can contribute. So at the very end, it would say, like, Princess is a contributor, Luigi's a contributor. I mean, that's how nerdy I am, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but <laughs> that kind of scope, or just a game like... For me, like Daisy was a huge like kind of reset for what I was playing at the time, and I, I guess for me, I, I missed out sort of on the Ultima Online experience that a lot of people had, and it was sort of a return to that where it was sort of this kind of hey, do whatever the fuck you want to do, and very emergent gameplay. So I think like with what we're trying to do, it's 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 sort of a blend of that where I, I just don't I'm I'm tired of the games where I have to get it and it's like. Like, this sort of happened with MMOs for me, where it's like you had to raid on Thursdays for, like, 12 hours to get anything out of an endgame experience. At least that's how it felt, right? Like, I jump in, and it's like, well, I don't know what to do, and I have to get in a group with, like, four other people. I have, like, two hours. Like, what can I do in two hours? And, uh, you know, that's something that, at least for me, I'm always keeping in the back of my head, because I'm getting older, and it's not like I'm trying to make a game for old people, but I'm trying to make a game that, like, people can sit down and... and not feel like they have to put in the the requisite forty hours, you know, to to get anything out of it. Um, and then also a big thing that, that at least was driving us when we were making it, or at least the, at least for the trailers and, and talking about it was, um, you know, games are now heavily YouTube driven, like heavily like spectator mode, where you know, for at least for us, like a small team, like we can certainly we can go make. I mean, RTS games are actually some of the hardest games to make and with all the systems, and I'm not really a big systems person, and to try to get it where, what, what are our strengths, and what can we do it in a way that, um, you know, that the player, uh, you know, when, when they at least see it, like, as I jokingly said, there's a lot of YouTube moments. There's a lot of, like, exciting things that would get the person, the player, to basically be totally psyched to play this game. Because that's, you know, it's sort of at that point where, for a lot of the time, it was like game mags. I remember getting like EGMs and uh, what is it, game fans, and like flipping through to look at like Mortal Kombat on the Sega Genesis, and like mm -hmm. you know because those pictures were so awesome, and like pictures were a big deal on the internet. Now you know like video, you can fucking watch people play the entire game. So for us, it's it's like a combination of that coupled with like emergent gameplay. So like everybody kind of gets their own perspective on how to play the game. It's that's, I mean, that's sort of a, uh, fuck, just a bunch of shit I threw at you, but like, <laughs> that's what we're working on. <laughs> when, uh, one thing that gets me for, um, I guess, like, indie games or, like, the indie scene, and uh, I don't know, I might sound like an asshole saying it, but it seems like there's a huge, like, sacrifice in quality, like, mm -hmm. visually, you know? And, I mean, I guess, like, a lot of that is... You know, you have probably a super small budget, really small team. Um, but I find that, like, a lot, at least a lot of the indie games that I see, uh, will, like, resort to this, you know, like, nostalgia kind of thing. Like, making it purposely look like crazy pixelated, you know, uh, you know, Super Nintendo kind of, like, graphics or something like that. I'm just not sure I can really get on board with that, man. Like, it almost becomes, like, distracting in a way, you know? It's almost like this like, forced, nostalgic feeling, you know, that just doesn't really connect for me, you know? And I think uh, that's one of the more, like, admirable things about your project is that it seems like, dude, I, I had no idea you had only, like, three people and, like, a few contractors or whatever, right? Like, it seems yeah. like it would be, a, like, a, you know, a dozen people at least, you know? Like, a pretty good size. Wish. No, <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, it, it seems great. So it's definitely refreshing for me to see... Uh, like, an indie title that, to me, is, like, almost, like, shoulder-to-shoulder shoulder with what you'd have, like, with AAA, you know, graphics, right? Yeah, I mean, when we came about, we talked a lot about style, and there was moments where I, you know, I, this is just what I do, right? This is, like, I mean, I'm going to be my Ian Wells looked at this, and he's like, oh, that's that's Parnell style. I'm like, what does that mean? Like, what? I don't know, I just... I, I made some stuff, and then you know Tim, who's uh, and Tim's awesome. He's like part environment artist, 
slash engineer. Like, I, I wouldn't even call him a tech artist. He's, he's like, right now he's doing, like, the level art. He's, like, doing like, a lot of the level, like, a lot of a lot of, level, a lot of our level art is really from Asset Store. We're just throwing shit in just to get it in and set up. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, like, he comes at it as an artist and as an engineer. So it's, ah, oh, it's really nice. It, it, it really fits between, I think, where I come at things and where maybe Chen comes at things, where, you know, you have a really tech-minded person, you have really, like, I'm not saying I'm more artistic than Tim, but just I don't know as much engineering. So it's, it, it blends really well for us. Um, you know, when we looked at the, when I was thinking about a lot of the style stuff, it was, it was just more of, like, I just felt most comfortable, and I felt like, to me, this is what I wanted to see. And mm-hmm. I felt like that was when we started doing a lot of tests and, and it just felt it felt really good, like running around and sort of this... At the time, it was more of like a, a, a desert world. And the reason it was desert world is that we were like, oh, we don't have to make shit. Like, it's, it's desert and there's nothing living. And so that's why it's kind of snowy because we can kind of put snow over shit. But it was more... Like, snow to me has always been really cool. And I've always loved sort of the atmosphere and the sort of isolation that happens like like desert i don't really like the movie Trem- tremors like, and, and, <laughs> and this is totally just out of there but like i don't like movies that take place in the middle of nowhere and like I, i've told my wife this like she's like you want to go see this movie I'm like ah, i can't she's like why i'm like it's just out in the middle of nowhere it's like this group of people out in the middle of nowhere. I, can't, I can't get behind that i like movies that feel either that or like for some reason snow feels like it's i don't know maybe it's just it's dormant it's not desolate so uh, yeah, so with snow, we started realizing, hey, you know, there's a lot of cool things that we can do. I mean, it's technically you use with, sna- with with sand, but mm-hmm. with snow, you can you can tell where the player has been or where other you know creatures have been. You can you know help tell stories that way very much without having to do a lot of UI. I did UI on at Iron Lore. I did you know I, I had to oversee a lot of UI. I, I fucking hate UI and. It's just, it's, it's literally like I, you know, have put not a mandate, but a very strong, like, we should do everything in our power to make there be no fucking UI and as little to no VO as possible. And then mm-hmm. my problem with VO is just that it tends to be like this, it, it usually is really shitty VO, and it's usually, like, it takes me out of the game. Like, I, I just... Well, I, Especially when it's something that you would never say, right? Like if you're supposed to be the character and you're like playing and you're like, ah, looks like the door is locked. Or yes, something like yes. that, right? It's like oh, you you like you'd never fucking say that to yourself. Like you just kinda of rattle the door knob and be like, you know, it's like mm, okay. You know? Yeah, so you, you would you, you would go up to the door, right? And you'd rattle it. You hear the sound that the door is like making a locked sound. Mm-hmm. It would it's way more you know, inclusive in that regard, because you're like, oh, I'm I'm with that person. But when you hear this person be like, oh, I'm really tired. Yeah. Like, oh God. Oh, God. Just, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's like you just roll your eyes. Yeah. And and then then if we're so if we're making that right, and so we're going and spending the cash to get a decent VO artist to do that, because there's mm-hmm. good VO artists. But you got to pay to get that, and then it's like, oh, now we want it for our other. Uh, international audiences that want that, and so now you're doing the VO on that, and so you're getting it in, you know, German or French, Italian, which is like typical, or you, well, for us, it would be like Portuguese, and you start getting, you know, you have to, you have to, it's, it becomes exponential in terms of the cost, and so plus, like people don't really like to read, and when we had, we had some UI up, like for stamina and health. And it just completely took you out of the game. All you wanted to do was stare at like stamina and stare at your health. Mm-hmm. And when we took that away, we realized, okay, now we have to give feedback hooks. But and we've been working on that like a lot actually to make that really you know obvious to the player, but also to not be like obstructive. But it's it feels so much better when you're running through. You just you're just in the world, and mm-hmm. that's. I mean, actually, there's an article that just came out on Kama Sutra about Assassin's Creed 1 and how it had no HUD and how it was awesome because of that. And mm-hmm. so that was sort of like, I patted myself on the back. I patted, you know, I sent Tim and, and Chen. I was like, look, like, this is, like, this is what we should, you know, we're, we're not stupid. Like, HUDs aren't necessarily bad, but if you can remove as much as possible, depending on your game, obviously. I mean, if you're yeah. playing WoW and there's, like, a thousand skills and everything else, obviously that makes sense. Mm-hmm. But um, I just... The less, the better, in my opinion. So, 
how how are you guys showing like a uh, like degradation of like health and stamina? Is it through like animations? Would it be like re- yeah. like remember like Resident Evil, right? Like where you you get like shot and you start like fucking limping around and stuff yep. like that. Yeah, so you'll limp. I mean, you'll your character will limp. I mean, like right now we have where you know your lower health you get, you you limp. Your you know low stamina, you're gasping for air. Um, then we start doing some post effects. So health is kind of you know heartbeats and and like pulsing red. Um, the blurring of vision is a big thing. Aim, like your aim is is severely Im- impacted. So that's something like we've we bounced around with. Like obviously we love DayZ, right? And we love a lot of, at the time, survival games, but we're trying, I mean, one of the things at least I'm trying to, you know, when I talk with Tim and Chen about it a lot is, like, you know, we need to be, as I refer to, like, survival light, and, because we can easily go in and go full on into crafting mode and just spend, like, hours upon hours running around finding the eighth bandage, eighth out of ten bandages you need to find to do whatever, or the eighth piece of wood you need. I mean, we can do that, right? But then we're spending all this time and effort when we're missing out on the entire goal of what it is, which is we want to fight big fucking bosses. So, I mean, that's, that, you know, I, I love the idea that, you know, when I bring up, like, I've mentioned, like, Deus Sex and some other games where you kind of go in with what you have, and you can choose to try to go find more, but it's, it's kind of a pain in the ass. It's, it's not, well, I don't mean pain in the ass, but it's not easy. And, you know, you have to really decide, you know, what are you, what are you best at and how, how best to solve those problems so that, like, you know, John can have a totally different experience. Gabby can have a totally different experience, and Lena, you can have a, like a totally different experience. At least that's what our our goal is, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the feedback is just something that we've really, I think, when you don't have those HUDs that just like blink, like low health or you're low stamina or whatever. Like mm-hmm. we're really trying to make sure come through. And and part of that is, I mean, there is VO involved in that, so the character will you know gas. So we have to go. You know, hire somebody or, or find some you know stock sounds of someone gasping for air and then hope to God that the gasping the player understands like that means you're like low health you know the, when mm-hmm. the, the, the area around you is getting like tunnel vision and the sound <clears throat> effects are getting like lo fi you know you're gonna mm-hmm. pass out or you're gonna you know run out of stamina you're running slow like the snow is deep so a lot of that kind of stuff I mean I hope I hope people like it I mean I think that's at least how I would want to play a game. Yeah, it sounds quite immersive, and I think that's something that's something that uh, is not happening all too too much these days with all these like uh, Xbox One, PS4, PC games. And I mean, that's just a personal opinion, but um, it's quite hard to really get lost in the story and environment when there's so many games throwing so much shit in your face, and then you don't like don't even know how your equipment works and your inventory and there's like five different yeah. tabs and then you can have like eight different weapons and you switch it out and all these buttons and I'm just like, dude, I don't even know what's going it, on. It's decision paralysis, right? Where you're, I mean, this is what we we're running into where like the UI almost, it, they try to make it in a sense where when we're making these games, right, that like you have all this UI that's trying to get you to do one thing and but there's like so many things that that we have to put in to let you know that, that it's there because we just spent all this time developing it and it's just like you're just inundated where they have to throw in the kitchen sink and it sucks it's like it's i'm not saying that what we're doing is perfect either but it's sort of the progression of this shit where like i'm really happy about vr because vr sort of resets all of that where now like when we were working on our game I can't really talk about that, obviously, but like well, the way I looked at it, it was that it was a reset. You didn't have to throw in everything because it, here is this totally new experience of of how you're playing said games, right? Where when you look at any of the new VR tech demos, I mean, it's like it's it's some of the shit they're doing is like if you were just to say that was a, an FPS game and just sell it that way, or like a third person game, most people would be like, uh, I already did that. What the fuck? But like. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not trying to say it's a gimmick, but, like, the minute you put it in VR, it's a totally different experience. And there are a whole bunch of issues that go along with that. Um, but, you know, it's it's just something that, like, I'm excited about because it at least gives us sort of a venue as these AAA, you know, developers can have this sort of relief where it isn't, oh, shit, we have to make... If we're going to make this game, we have to be able that we have, you know, these five features plus his other five features, and then they have to do like season pass to make sure that they can keep people paying long enough so that they can recoup 
the development costs. And that's, I mean, that's sort of the, the because, the, you know, A, the player doesn't really know how much most of the shit costs, and then they also want all of it because the game they just played last week had all of it. And that's, um, it's tricky. It's really tricky. Yeah, dude. That's crazy. I mean, I, we're working on, like, uh, VR, VR stuff at work, and... Uh, yeah, I saw your project. That project was awesome. We were shitting our pants when we saw it. <laughs> like, oh, oh my yeah. god, it has giant things, and they're, <laughs> we're doing giant things. Oh god. Yeah, yeah. I guess they are kind of similar. Like if uh, like you just kind of look at them, but um, uh, yeah, dude. Like the difference between, you know, just having a controller and staring at a TV versus having something like on your head and like being able to like look around as like kind of a an input, you know, is mm-hmm. uh changing the way that you even like design games or even make art like for the like the motion oh, yeah. sickness thing or um like flickering and like buzzing and stuff like that you got to kind of you know construct art in a different way so that it doesn't make people sick and it has to run at like 90 frames a second or something yep. so yep um so you got to make it fucking airtight you know it's cool again cuz it's it's sort of you don't have to do you're not. I mean, yes, you are fighting over pixels because you can get so close to them, but you're not. It's not. You can sort of pull back again. It's. It's always sort of been. At least for me, my my. It feels like, anyways, that my career has sort of been able to be in sort of that Titan Quest slash like pushing what Titan Quest could have been, which was we did normal maps. We were. I mean, we did. We definitely did. Like at least I was doing a lot of ZBrush stuff. I mean, Bobo and Singh and the rest of the guys, they were just killing it with hand painted. Um, but by the end, we were all kind of inching into that. Um, I used it probably more as a crutch because I just couldn't like kill it as much as like Bobo or Tarwater. Those guys were like fucking awesome, right? Oh, and that's out of the group. Yeah, yeah. Those guys went out and made fucking Omnom. Like I, I contracted them when I was at Kickside. I was like, so I was like, we were making low poly hand painted stuff, and they do awesome stuff, right? But I was like, mm-hmm. I went to my boss. I'm like, we're getting these guys, and he's like, you don't want to talk to any people. I'm like, no, we're doing these guys. So like, why? I'm like, <laughs> because this is like, you don't want to get it. Like this is like, these these are the best at low po- like if you want low poly hand painted and you don't like, have time to like think, mm-hmm. just fucking go. Like and this yeah, and they just like hit him up and I was like I didn't even I swear to God I did, like from a style he's like what's the style I'm like just make it like Bobo dude just do it I I don't have time like it just mm-hmm. needs to be done and it was like a week later I had them all and I think we had to redo all of them because we kept redoing the art style but it was like done we had him in game running around it was anyways. <laughs> Sorry, just fully fucking went off on the tangent. Um, so I, I guess before uh, before we go, we're like almost at like an hour and a half here. Uh, since we probably won't have another podcast before GDC, um, I kind of wanted to get your guys' uh, you know, so I'll be looking at like a ton of portfolios and stuff like that. So I'm kind of wondering what each of your like rainy cloud sticker would be for somebody bringing a portfolio to you? Like, what's, God. like, the one mistake that they would do that you just want to, like, fucking throw their portfolio across the room? Who's going to stop? Any, anyone? Anyone? Troy, you go first. Um, yeah, I've got one. Um, I think my, my, one of my biggest ones has always been um, if you, if you are applying for like a, well, any kind of position really, but if you're applying for a character artist position, then I don't want to see like environments in your folio, man. Mm-hmm. I don't want to see props and rubbish bins and, and, and any of that kind of stuff. I just, uh, it's like a, especially if that stuff is first as well. It's like I click on it, I'm like looking at your work and then instantly all I see is environments. That's like, um, I'm out, dude. Like you've lost your, you've lost your shot. You know what I mean? Yeah, dude. Uh, that that was always like a real big one for me, and um, yeah, yeah. I'm just yeah. gonna leave it at that. I I think uh, for me, kind of in the similar vein, it's uh, applying for like a a game artist position, or going to the game developers convention uh, or conference, and uh, your portfolio has absolutely no game art in it. Drives me fucking insane. Like uh, having like I mean, I love ZBrush, man. I can. Uh, sculpt all day and be a, a happy happy boy but um, 
man, you got to show like all of it. You know what I mean? Like only having these crazy zebra sculpts and absolutely no painting, no low poly, no real time anything is a uh, that's a big big sad face. Yeah. What about just showing up with a resume? That's always a winner Dude, as well. Dude, uh, at the uh, <laughs> yeah, at the uh, the the thing I do, um, I've had people show up with no portfolio, zero portfolio. They show up to the portfolio review with nothing. You know? <laughs> what are they expecting? Yeah. What do you do? <laughs> and, like, and, but like, since it's timed, and I mean, they wait in line, so. They deserve. They deserve something. Just like, you just kind of like you. Just, yeah, you just end up talking to them. It's like so. Hey. So have you ever? So have you ever, <laughs> ever made anybody? Have you ever made anybody cry? No, no. I've uh, I've actually got feedback before that I was too nice, and that like I guess based on my, I guess back in the day my more crass uh, poly count days, uh, they were expecting me to be like fucking just eviscerating them. But uh, no, I'm actually. I'm not not a complete asshole, so. Oh, how come? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> this is weird. Yeah. So I had a, I had I had someone cry on me, uh, and then I, <laughs> and I, I'm not me- I'm not a bad a mean person. It mm-hmm. was it was one of those kind of shitty situations where, you look over someone's portfolio and they're just not there, right? Like it's just not there. And then you get somebody literally right after, so they're standing behind them, a kind of. You know, you've, you've you had a little chat with them, you're just kind of like, oh, we work on these things, and then you're kind of glowing over this other person's resume, mm-hmm. and they see that, and I, that caused that person to, you know, kind of break up, mm-hmm. like there, and I was like, ah, uh, uh, and I deal with that, and that's that's tough. It's like, okay, I, I mean, I I'm I can't, It's not like I'm going to give you a job because you're you're crying. Like that's not that's not how this works. I I need to still be. You need to work on these things, but realize that, like, we've all come from, like, we all have our stories, right, our, our histories, mm-hmm. and so you explain to them that. Um, and that was, yeah, that was that was a moment. Uh, Damn, yeah, was, was that, like, on the, the show floor, or was that, like... Oh, a, yeah. That oh, was wow. the, like, the Friday where they, the, ki- uh, the kids, the <laughs> um, college kids come in, or with their portfolios, and they show kind of portfolio review. Mm-hmm. It was it was that, and then I had some like f- like weirdo guy. I remember coming get in my face. That was, and I wasn't apparently like probably more like you back in the poly count day. I was just like kind of threw it back in his face because he basically was coming in and just he was crazy. I mean, honestly, certifiably crazy. Like mm-hmm. hands were like creepily shaking in a way that was like not normal, and <laughs> it's just like, oh, what is going on? And I'm like, why do I always? Why do I? Why does the crazy gravitate to me? <laughs> uh, like, I was like turning to my. And I think Hawkins was with me at the time. I don't know if he was. The, I mean, I'd love to know if he remembers that moment because he was talking with me, and I kind of got in trouble because I was like talking, like I was, you know, being too friendly with people I knew and not dealing with the, the reviews at, at at length. But this mm-hmm. person, I guess, wanted to be an analyst or something for game analytics, and oh, it was just doing right. this shit. And it was like uh, he, he was—he had all this paperwork, and it was all crumpled up, and he kept like throwing it at me. And I was like, "Dude, I've taken your portfolio. I've taken your—you know—your email address. Like, we'll get back to you." And then he started just going and just blabbing on about I don't remember what. And I remember I. I probably like, I don't really hide things on my face very well, and mm-hmm. I I think I just looked like totally pissed off. But uh, yeah, those are my memories. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Yeah. What uh, what about you, Lena? What would your uh, your rain cloud sticker be? Um, it's kind of hard to say from from someone in my position because um, I still very much feel like in the group of the people of people that would stand in line for portfolio reviews. I haven't been in the industry as long as you guys, um, if at all, really. Mm-hmm. But um, from my perspective, if I were to look at a portfolio, um, it probably my top two things would be uh, portfolios filled with like ZBrush quick sketches, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. quick idea busts, you know, designs or whatever, um, and Characters that weren't posed, like game characters, because game characters is one thing, but when it's a portfolio filled with T poses, 
I think it really separates you from a lot of people when you take the time to at least even mildly pose it and have some nice renders. Mm -hmm. I think so that's I think really, that's awesome advice because T-Pose, I don't know about you guys, but like forever in the industry, I mean, we as artists, right, we can look at a T-Pose and, and imagine it in our head posed. Yeah. But no one else. So like anybody listening is like, oh, I'm making my portfolio, I'm coming GDC, Gab, here I come. <laughs> like that T-Pose character is never going to get through the recruiter. Like, mm -hmm. never. It's yeah. going to look shitty no matter what. I mean, there's, I don't care how good your shoulder stretching or whatever or your awesome Z brushing is. Like, it just, like, no one wants to see a character like that. Just pull the, pull the arms down. That's, I mean, mm -hmm. just, that's all you have to do. God, dude, it's so easy to post shit now. You know, right? like, yeah. you can do it in Z brush. Yes. You can do it, like, fuck, man, you can make, like, an arm in, like, three seconds. You know what I mean? Like, just, just drop the arm. Just drop it. Yeah. I feel like there's literally zero excuse at this point in time to not take some time to pose it mm -hmm. properly. Actually, I can I'll, I'll chip in with a little tidbit right there. It's kind of funny. Um, I don't know if you guys know, um, but uh, Vadim Slipgate Central he won a fucking art competition by literally he he built his character in fucking T pose, right? And everybody else was like these epic poses and cool shit like this, dude. He just dropped the fucking arms down, took a picture of the bust from like the fucking chest up, and won. <laughs> he didn't even do anything, dude. It's just it's just the fact that he took the time to like drop that shit down and like maybe just like you know settle the shoulders a little bit and give it a little bit of weight, and that was it, man. Winner. Wow. Like, yep. I mean, it just makes such a difference, dude. Yeah. Yeah, dude. Yep. Even if you leave it in like an A pose, but you just take the head and you like tilt it or Turn rotate it. it. Yeah. 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 Like that's it. It gives it, can, it gets like the subtlest amount. And even if it's like a shitty amount of personality, it gives it more than just like I am a T pose. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Mr. Mr. Blank face. Yeah. And the other the other thing I'd say like what I did so recently last GDC. <clears throat> this is what I still. That kicks out right before I left, and so my buddy, who's now who hired me from the VR company, we were at a bar at left. I think it was at, at Lefties, like in the back, mm -hmm. and he's like, "Hey, here's some guys. Why don't you look at their portfolio?" And I was really, I had really drank a lot, so I was really punchy, but I was incredibly brutal. But I was like, "I'm gonna be brutal. You, you want to be? You want me to be brutal?" And they're like, "Oh, okay," and I said, "Okay." Like, and what I found, like, in my drunken sort of spin of, I was, I was just like, not like slamming on them and stuff, but my main thing was like, they were showing me stuff that was just bizarre. And I was mm -hmm. like, would you look at, now you're the art director, now tell me what you would change. And, it, and I didn't say anything. I would just ask him that question, like, to, or not even, just that statement. Just be like, if you were the art director, what would you change? This is, and I would literally grab their portfolio from them and then hand it to them and say, hi, I'm looking for a job. And that's literally what I did like two or three times. And the responses I got out of that where they knew, they knew all their problems. They were like, oh, well, I wouldn't do this. I don't know why I put this light here. I'd be like, I'm like, and they were, they were saying, it was weird, they were saying it to me, but, but it's their work. And they yeah. were literally, they knew all the, half the problems. It was just sort of, I think, where a lot of artists get, myself included, is you work on something and you sort of marry yourself to it. And you have a hard time kind of divorcing yourself from that and actually crit you know, critiquing it. Because it's your work. You, you know, it can't be, there's nothing wrong with it. I did it. And I think, especially students, you get into this sort of vacuumous bubble where you get used to either the praise of your other classmates or, you know, you're just not used to professional critique that you need to take that work away where it's not your work. And that was something, I mean, yeah, I had a couple of drinks, but, like, I was doing that to, like, multiple people and seeing a response that I would never have thought to get where it was really... Like, okay, there's all your work. I don't need to say anything. Like, that's exactly what I would have said. So go change those things. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. cool. That's a, yeah, man. I'm going to have to steal that from you, I think. Just yes. do that the entire well, time through the, yeah, like, this, the whole line. <laughs> this way I can review portfolios while drunk. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't, well, yeah. It was, it was pretty, yeah. <laughs> this is the solution to all my problems. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Uh, another thing is like, uh, I mean, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but people who want to be concept artists but are actually illustrators, 
Oh, uh, you know, God. Yeah. it's just uh, like there's no actual concept. Like there's nothing you could work from at all. It's just kind of a a nice painting, I suppose. Um, but uh, yeah, man, I see that all the time. You know, um, and then like having to explain that, like for me, I'd almost rather see a bunch of sketches and like thought process versus uh, this like crazy rendered thing. It's like I. It doesn't matter, man. Like even at work, like the concepts that I get, like I'd rather them be looser so that I could kind of fill in the blanks myself versus like this crazy, crazy high polish, like you know, beautiful like work of art that took like three months to make. You know. Yeah. Mm. I feel so bad for that concept, kind of concept art in general. It's it's brutal because we get it. I mean, it took me a long time too to understand the really the difference between. What what it took in terms of the effort for a concept versus an illustration, and you get when you're in sort of kind of the industry at a point like you you'll have producers that are like, yeah, we'll just get some concept and we'll just you know make it our marketing piece. Mm -hmm. Like uh, that no, that's going to take a long time because you know you're going to ask for all these two, you're going to ask basically a rendering and they're like wait what yeah i'm asking you for a drawing it's like oh my god yeah and and you'll see that sometimes where yeah you get these either people that have three really good illustrations in their portfolio or you'll you'll get the opposite where you'll get sort of the really somebody who should go down the concept path and not focus as much but i feel like for concept artists getting in i they kind of i mean it sucks it's like it's sort of the 3d artist they have to sort of be able to sh at least show that they can do it all because, I, I mean, I don't, I mean, at least for me on these smaller teams, like, outside of even my, my, my company I'm starting, but, like, um, when we were smaller teams, it was, you kind of had to find somebody that could, it, it, at least on a rainy day, take a concept to full completion. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, from a concept artist, you want to see that they aren't just glued to one style. Um, and that's, I think, especially for kids coming out of college, sometimes you'll see that a lot, where they'll, they got really good at their tricks, and they got really good at that one style, and they'll show you a billion different iterations on that style. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean... You get like a, a, a hundred different uh, Ben Morrow uh, rip-off robots, you know? Oh, oh yeah, a kit bashing, that's a whole other, that's a, yeah. that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> uh... So I guess before we uh, before we go, since I think it's probably the dream of everybody to uh, break the shackles of working for uh, somebody else and going off and doing their own thing, I mean, what advice would you give to somebody that wanted to do that? Um, I guess for me, like, what would be the the best advice? It's hard. I mean, so. If somebody's looking to like, it's hard because you can you could easily be like, I want to just if you're an artist that just wants to go do, do freelance art. Obviously, I would listen to you guys because <laughs> I mean you guys have done it. Um, but to go and make a game, I would think the best thing is that the way I looked at it at least was if I could make this game for the, like if this was it, this is all I could make. This is what I want to do. Like don't don't look at it as at least the way I looked at it was uh, make a game that like you're like oh this is cool right now like that's I think really you're gonna shoot yourself in the foot but if you're looking to to make a game that you could see like because in a lot of ways you could be stuck on that desert island which is your company or whatever and that's mm -hmm. all you could make like that would be it right I could find a ton of like fun doing that so to me that was sort of the dream. If I'm going to go and do the dream, I may as well do the game with it that I want to make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's cool, and man. Sure, and I'm sure when we hang up, I'll have a totally better, well-worded answer. But. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Uh, I've always kind of thought that as well, man. I've always yeah. thought that as well. You may as well, you know, be at least working on something that you're like, fuck, I would play this shit out of this, as opposed to, oh, guys, we've got to start off making the fucking Connect 4 game first, yeah. you know? The like first, we, first we do Dots, then we yeah. do Solitaire, then we'll do Battle Chess. <laughs> yeah. Then uh, then we'll do a side-scroller. And ten, yeah. years, ten, 10 years from now, we'll actually be doing what we want to do. Yeah, yeah. that's... I, no. I think that's pretty spot on, honestly, to just... Um, 
do exactly what it is that you want, regardless if you feel that it will or will not succeed, because the whole point is you're supposed to you know, doing what you want to do. And um, even if you're stuck in XYZ job for XYZ amount of time, to just force yourself to allot yourself time at some point of the day throughout the week to get steps closer to what it is you want to be doing. Because you could go on forever being like, well, I need to finish this project at this job, and I've got kids, I've got dogs, I've got a wife, I, I can't find the time. But really, yeah. if you really want to be doing it, there's, there's always, always a way. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. And, and I think really for for when I got to that point was that we're we're in an industry that is already risky. Like it's it's stupid risk. Like the fact that we're doing this is dumb. Like we're not in this for the money. I mean, yes, we get paid hopefully decently, but like games are like not really like, oh god, I wish I was rich. It's like, dude, then go Go freaking work in finance, or go work at a bank, or whatever, whatever makes money, like a ton of money. That's that's what you want to do. But like, if you're in games, and then you really only live once. Like, just just do what you want to fucking do. Like, do that's the thing that like you are that you could die doing. Because mm -hmm. in the end, like, if you if you're just doing shit that's not making you happy, why are you doing it? And I know it's like so mm -hmm. cliche. I hope you what you're passionate about, but it's. When I'm sitting here, it's like, well, I mean, if I hit had a truck tomorrow, like at least I'm happy that like I I got out of what I was doing before. Well, I loved what I was doing before the VR place, but like in terms of sort of the corporate sort of shit, like this is this is what I want to do. So, <laughs> hooray! <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, I think it's a good place to stop. Yeah. Hooray! Yep. I miss you guys already. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to do a uh, we'll have to do part two in like a few weeks. Oh, I love that! <laughs> All right, guys. All right, man. Bye, bye. Right, cool. Nice uh, talking with you. You too. Bye. bye. All right.